What up? <laughs> hey, man. Um, yeah, thanks for doing this. I know it's been a long time since we talked, probably since, like, what, like, it's gotta be high school, like, face-to-face, at least. Yeah, 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 for sure. Shit, man. So, yeah, what year was that? 2004? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a long time ago. Wow, man, so much has changed, and I've been, I've been following you, um, obviously we stay in touch with Instagram and stuff like that, so it's been cool to see how much, you know, has progressed in your, like, photography career. Um, it's unbelievable, man. I was just on your website and the work is, you know, I'm, I'm always commenting anyway, but the work is just incredible. First time in a while I looked at the website and it's just like premium, premium wildlife, uh, and, uh, landscape and, uh, those night shots. Thanks. Unbelievable. Thank you, man. Um, let's talk about, let's just dive right in. And I was just tell everybody who you are and what you do and where you live. So my name is Brandon Broderick. I, uh, I live in Terrace, British Columbia, which is northwest part of the province, and uh, I do wildlife and nature photography. And how long have you been doing it now? I got my first digital SLR in 2007, and really focused on wildlife these last like eight years or so, and even more so in the last couple of years. Um, I've, I've, I used to do a lot of more landscapes and, uh, yeah, now I've just, I, I don't know, something's drawing me further and further into the wildlife side of things and it's, it's awesome. Um, tell, like, let's talk about, let's talk about a little bit like where you started in terms of like, um, I was reading a little bit in the bio and you were saying you didn't really start taking it seriously till, uh, people start asking your friends or asking for your, uh, screen, um, screen savers and, <laughs> Talk about that a bit. Yeah, I should probably update that that bio. I need to it's, really, it's really bad. It's really bad. Gotta get on so, that, um, man. Yeah, especially before this this goes out. Uh, um, yeah, so I just I was in college and I had a little like three megapixel Sony point and shoot camera. And my second year of college, I lived on a lake, and I would just take like sunsets and I don't know, just you know, shots you take when you live on a lake. <laughs> and I shared a house with uh, with three other guys, and a few of them started to ask to use them as like desktop backgrounds for their for their computers. You know, back when the monitors were massive things that actually took up the entire desktop. Um, yeah. So, and that's the only reason I started taking photos was so I would have my own pictures for my own desktop backgrounds, and then it it just progressed from there. I started to. Yeah, I was. I actually found an old hard drive the other day and found some some pictures that I took with, like, just terrible photos with a huge watermark across it. Like, no one, no one would ever ever take it. Like, there's they would never ever want to steal the photo. And <laughs> so it, it went from from that, and then I bought my first uh, DSLR just after college, and it came with just a, a zoom lens and a wide angle. And then from there, it was just practicing all the techniques, you know, the slow shutter speed type stuff. And then, yeah, then it's just progressed into where it is now, where I, I, I mainly focus on wildlife. I've self-published a few photo books. I, yeah, I'm just, I just, I'm so focused on photography. It's, it's crazy now. That's kind of all I think about. Um... I remember in high school, like way back, I don't know how this is in my brain, um, like, cause I don't, rem- it's so hard to remember um, that far back, but uh, I remember there was like a conversation in the hallway. I don't know if we were hanging around like the library. Do you remember we used to hang around kind of like, well, at least the people we talked to, um, we kind of hung around the front of the library, but I remember it might've been that area, but I remember you saying you wanted to be like a forest ranger or something in the wilderness. And so as the years went by and like then I started seeing your photography it was like oh man he actually went out and like did what he kind of <laughs> you're actually you've always been interested in wildlife and the outdoors right so is that something yeah. is that something your parents like did you guys go camping a lot like tell me about that so I grew up on uh Todd Lane no one <laughs> no one out here where I am is gonna know this reference but so behind Todd Lane was just forest and while growing up, everyone else was 
interested in like being social and i was following these these game trails and pulling off little bits of deer fur and <laughs> man i was such a no i got bullied a lot in high school and i, I understand why I was, not <laughs> cool, I was not cool at all so yeah i was just uh, i was so into uh just just being in nature I, I built a tree fort up in a tree that i would sometimes do homework in and i i would just sit and like watch birds like just birds would just I, I can still do that i can still just sit and watch a squirrel for 20 minutes and not be bored at all and um yeah so i grew up having nature so close and i wanted to be a uh well, I wanted to be a tool maker at first because that's what my dad was. Oh, okay. And he he was not happy with my decision when I said I wanted to be a conservation officer because this was after he had bought me like hundreds of dollars in specialized tools to, oh, man. to, be, a, to be an apprentice. <laughs> yeah, I still remember that conversation. It didn't go well. But um, yeah, so I want to be a conservation officer. I went to school. I took fish and wildlife in uh, Lindsay, Ontario at Fleming College. And... I feel like first semester, they're like, yeah, there's no jobs. There's, there's no jobs. I don't even know why you guys are here. So I, was, I went into it, and it just, I, I kind of just, I, I, I enjoyed it, but I did enough to get to get out of there and was just trying to get jobs. And I've just recently, within the last few years, I've actually put that diploma to use for the first time doing some fisheries work. Um, I still would like to be a conservation officer or a fisheries technician or a fisheries officer one of those one day i did a, i interviewed to be a fishery officer a few years ago and i i bombed i did terrible in the interview it was there was only like 12 of us in the entire province that got interviews for like nine positions so i only had to be in like the i i, I did so bad man it was like i i literally apologized for wasting their time it was so bad oh man <laughs> So I'm, I'm just trying to gain more, uh, more life experience and, uh, yeah, like it's an enforcement career, but you need to have enforcement experience to get it. So it's a tricky process. So. I see. Um, so, yeah. so you, what are you doing right now for work other than the photography? So I am a, uh, I work for a cleaning company as a janitorial supervisor. So we have a contract at the college here and I just manage that make sure the, uh, school gets cleaned every night which is it works well with my photography because i don't start work till about 3 3 30 p.m every day so i have the mornings free to to do my thing nice because it seems yeah. like you're out all the time taking photos i try to be yeah it's it's honestly if i have money to put fuel into my tank to go then i'll, I'll go that's really the only holdback if i had unlimited money and fuel i would be out constantly taking photos now, what yeah. what about getting you've gotten you've gotten your stuff into magazines and stuff like that, right? I um who who have you gotten in with? Uh, I th what you tell me, sorry. Uh, a bunch at now. I, I just don't. Uh, yeah, it's. it's I, I I always forget. I never really think about it. <laughs> it's um, like a lot of the tourism guides out here have used my stuff. Um, Canadian Geographic has started to use my stuff a lot more recently. Yeah. Uh, Ontario Out of Doors, Outdoor Canada, Canadian Musician when I used to shoot concerts. Uh, I've got a, a picture in a National Geographic book, and uh, National Geographic had one of my pictures as a downloadable desktop background on their website for a while. That's so cool. Um, yeah, lots of random little little local stuff too. Now, in terms of like. I'm sure you think about it all the time, like, f like doing photography just full time, because like you clearly could. Like, what, what's the game like in photography? You know, I work in video, so it's so it's different. So I just don't know what the, what the like. Do you know a lot of photographers that just do photos for a living, or what's the game? Yeah, there it is possible, and I I feel like skill wise, I'm at the point where I could I could do it full time now, and. Man, I'm terrible at running a business. I'm good at the picture. I'm good at the picture, picture taking part, but I need the. There's that whole other part of it that I, I just don't have the, uh, like the, the the confidence, the the knowledge. Um, what I would like to do is start uh, leading photo tours, because I know this area really well. 
I know where to go to find things. Um, again, it's just a matter of setting that up. It doesn't help right now that tourism has kind of taken a complete dive. Yeah, yeah. So he can't. right now, I'm yeah, I'm just focused on building my, my portfolio and trying to yeah. I thought from an outsider's perspective, I didn't. I thought for sure you had your your shit together because, dude, your your website's super pro. You got up to date photos. Like your Instagram's up to date. Everything's consistent. Like, um, but uh, yeah, I would have thought you you knew what you're doing business wise, and you you put you self you you self released your those books. Um, and you're it looks like you were always out like with you. You have your at conventions or with your tent and you get, you know, get your stuff out there. Like, tell me yeah, about there's that. A, uh, there's a farmer's market here in Terrace that I, uh, that I set up at every Saturday from May to October. That's, that's usually how I, how my, how I sell my books, how I, I sell prints, you know, cards, just that's where I do most of my sales and where I meet people, where I get my name out there. Mm-hmm. But it's just like, it's like four hours of small talk about photography every Saturday. It's, it's it's a lot of fun. You love that, yeah. I'm, that would be super cool. I guess it's not happening now. Um, the no, we're trying to figure out a way to uh, to make it happen. I'm on the uh, the board of directors for the market, and we're trying to make it happen. The public is not happy that it's not happening yet, so we're trying to make it work with just you know farmers only, or we're trying to make it work safely for everyone. So yeah, that's that's where we're at with that right now. Let's talk about um, going from Windsor to BC and like how you made that happen. Because I know a lot of people, a lot of people for us in smaller towns. I still work from Windsor, but I travel back and forth from Toronto when I need to. But uh, uh, I know people that just up and left, um, and then people like you that went even further, right, like to BC. So I know that's there's challenges in there, and I kind of just want to talk about that because I know there's a lot of younger kids like when I, I sometimes I talk at the college here or the university and there there's a lot of like in smaller towns like this as you know there's a lot of adversity to trying to be creative and you know be yourself and have that kind of support so I think it'd be cool if you you know someone like you talked about um how you you know basically made that happen uh, not that you always have to leave a small town um, but that sometimes you have to because of the lifestyle you want and the career yeah. you want, right? So tell me about Windsor to BC. Yeah, I, I like, I just, I grew up in Windsor. I love nature and there just wasn't enough of that there for me. I, for some reason, like I always was drawn to BC. I had never been here before. I, I it just, it looked like an amazing place. So I, um, I had, I had moved from Windsor to college up in Lindsay and then back down to Windsor for a bit, then up to Northern Ontario, then back to Windsor, then to Orillia. And then from Orillia, I was working, I was doing pest control, which is a job that Fish and Wildlife Diploma gets you, taking raccoons and stuff out of people's attics. Uh, so I was, I was doing that. And then they, they told me I was getting laid off for the winter, which I had no idea. I just moved to Aurelia, and they're like, yeah, you're getting laid off in a few months. So Jeez. I wasn't happy about that, so I started looking for jobs. And literally within five days, I was living and working in Vancouver. So it's for me, it's just been find a cool place to go and then find a job that's there. So you're, you've, you've got a source of income when you're there. Um, I ended up doing the same pest control that I was doing. I already had the experience. So it was an easy job to get. So I got to BC. I had a company vehicle that I could use for personal use. So I was able to just explore my personal time. Um, and yeah, I just started exploring the Vancouver area. Then, uh, then I ended up in Haida Gwaii, which is off the Northwest coast of BC. I was, uh, I was a photographer and dock hand at a fishing lodge for the summer. And then went back to Vancouver and was doing the pest control thing again. And then I got a phone call from my grandparents telling me that my dad had passed away back in Windsor. Oh, geez. So back in 2010, I, I quit my job and I went back to Windsor. And I was the executor of his estate, so I did, I did deal with all that stuff. I ended up being there for just about two years in total. And... I do. I, I like Windsor a lot. It's a great city. It's it's grown a lot since I've I've been away. But 
man, I could only shoot the same deer and ducks so many times before I was like, I need, I need more. And, uh, my family's got some, um, my mom and stepdad have property in a place up in Northern Ontario near Kirkland Lake. So in those two years I was back, I was just back and forth up there, like just being in as much nature as possible. And I just got bored. So I started looking for, for more work, found another pest control job. I actually got two job offers from two different companies. One was in Labrador city, Labrador, like way the opposite direction of where I am now. And then the other one was here. So I, I took this one. I started to research both areas and man, there's white black bears out here. Yeah. So like, that's crazy. Yeah. That's, so, I saw your photos of that, man. I didn't even know they existed in uh, this area or in your area. Yeah, it's a, there's a small population of them, and they only exist in this area. Oh, wow. It's, uh, so, yeah, that was a big a big factor to moving out here, and I'd never been to this area before. I just uh, I found a place to live online. I found a job online, packed up my stuff into a U-Haul, and drove out here, and I, I just wanted to photograph this area. So I've just been doing random jobs to let me uh i think i've had 28 different jobs now in my life just to allow me to keep taking photos up here i don't get fired or anything i just uh i just like to learn new skills and stuff and if uh, a cool new job comes up you know it's worth looking into no that's great man i love that i've had so many crazy jobs too and um i know a lot of people just in video or photography that you just do what you got to do to to get to the get to your camera right so um, yeah, man, I admire that. I think that's super cool that you, it sounded like you just, you just went and did it, right? There was no, like, um, you wanted to do something, so you pursued that, and you're still pursuing that, so that's how you, that's how you go and do it. And I think that's a really important, like, lesson for a lot of younger people, um, and just a good reminder for myself is that, I mean, if you, if you really want something, you just gotta go out and do it. <laughs> you're not, you can't yeah. wait, a, you can't wait around, or hope that Windsor's going to get, like, in your case, a bunch of new animals to film. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, right. if you want to... mountains that just sprout up out of nowhere, yeah. Yeah, like, you just were in, you, you, you were just in Africa, too, right? Yeah, um, yeah that was on Amazing Africa. photos there. It's like, if you want to go and shoot African safari, like, you're going to have to go to Africa. So, um, but yeah, tell me, talk about Africa a bit. What's it like for, what was it like oh, for man. you? So that was crazy. That was with uh, that was a family trip. My my mom and stepdad have been planning that for our family for I don't know, like eight, ten years, something like that. Wow. So it finally came, and man, it ended just in time before the uh, the world ended. Um, yeah. So it was. I I've never been outside of North America before. Like I've been to. Cancun and Dominican Republic like most people from Windsor that's just kind of where you go on vacation yeah. and yeah I uh yeah we flew into Rwanda and then well no sorry let me go back we flew to Amsterdam first yeah which was awesome and uh we were there for two nights so that was a cool uh just to see Europe it was a pretty laid-back thing I, uh, I'm not, I'm not big on crowds. I don't, uh, I don't like lots of crowds. I've had, uh, so actually back in high school, I, I got my first concussion back in high school. I've had 11 now. So I'm my what I, happened in, I'm, what, what happened in high school? You got a concussion. Did you get beat up? Oh, no. Oh, well, okay. yeah, but not, that, that never caused the concussion. Okay. <laughs> yeah, man, I was just like launched into lockers sometimes. Seriously? Yeah, the, um, I don't know. Jeez. Oh, I, I could name drop and shit on. Some yeah, you don't right have now. to. I'm but not, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not I think I know. Through. I think I know the guys you're talking about. They're not nice people. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and dude, I was like four foot eleven, and yeah. I weighed like eighty something pounds in grade nine. Like I was, I was a, I was a child. I should not have been in high school, but uh, the age said I should be, so I was there. So it was in, uh, I think, grade nine or ten gym class. Um, one of the older kids came to the locker room. Yeah. I was sitting on the bench. Like, it's the lamest concussion story ever. I was sitting on the bench, and I just chirped him. I don't know if I, I... I don't remember what I said to him. I just jokingly said something that dudes say to each other. And he came up to me, and he, like... He kind of rushed me with his hands, and I, I 
jump back and I smoked my head off the uh, oh, cinder block shit. wall behind me. And that has led to just extreme anxiety when I shouldn't have it. Like really? in grocery stores when there's people. I had, I had a crazy panic attack about a year ago. Like I, I called 911. I thought I was dying. I've never. Wow. Like, I, yeah, I was walking around my house looking for where I was going to lay down and be found. Yeah, yeah, it was crazy, man. So, yeah, kids out there, there's some more advice. Don't hit your head. And it's just been random stuff ever since. Like, getting into my car. I can hit my head, get into my car, and have headaches. Jeez, man. Jeez. Okay, sorry. And I also lose my train of thought. What were we talking about? Oh, uh, sorry. <laughs> That's my fault. I went off on a tangent. Oh. Um, no, we were talking about um, basically... Um, Oh, fudge. Fudge. <laughs> uh, let me think about it. Let me just go my notes here. That's okay. It doesn't matter, man. I want these, uh, my whole point with like doing these conversations, like just to, uh, it's good to talk to people from different, uh, from different, uh, uh, perspectives and different career choices because it helps me, um, because we all have challenges every day and are create trying to be creative and like you're talking about your struggles and stuff like that. I have my own. So I find that just talking to other people, um, about their life and what they're learning, um, helps me and maybe it'll help other people. But, um, basically I think we were talking about, um, Fuck, I honestly don't remember. We were talking about how to make a living out of photography. Um, oh, no. Oh, how to, how you went from Windsor to BC, and yes. we you ended up... Oh, and then we were saying you can only... It's important to find a place that um, that's important to you because... I'm mean, sorry, it's, it's how do you want your life... Like, how what, what kind of life are you trying to create for yourself? And you were saying, I had to go... We were talking about Africa. Africa. Okay. So you're in so, Africa. <laughs> so I'm in. Uh, so Amsterdam two nights. Then flying to Rwanda. We're there for a night, and um, then from there we get into. Next morning we get briefed by our tour guides. Get on uh, into our safari vehicles and then drive to Uganda, and uh, we spent the night. One night or two nights? I think two nights. But on one of the days we we hiked two and a half hours to to see this family of wild mountain gorillas wow like, oh yeah so there's only like 800 of these things that exist in the world in that one small area uh which it's actually there's some heavy stuff happening there again right now there's people getting getting killed in some of the parks where the the gorillas are but yeah it's uh so you're our, our group, our family was big enough that like the eight of us, we made our own group. So it was just us and our guides. And there was also armed guards with us, not for animals, but because tourists get kidnapped. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's very, it's real over there. Like you gotta be aware, but the, the, um, because it's so dangerous, it feels so safe. If that makes any sense. Like, when we were in Kenya, in in Nairobi, you're going into some of the malls, or basically every mall, every hotel, everywhere there, you go through metal detectors. Your bags get scanned, everything. Yeah. So that's what I mean. All that stuff's only in place because of how dangerous it is, but because it's all in place, you feel safer. Yeah, I know what you mean. Because um, I, I, I went to Tanzania when I did Kilimanjaro. I don't know if you saw any of that, but it was the same thing. Armed guards at all the hotels... And yeah. yeah, I never, it's funny with all the danger, you really didn't feel, I didn't feel threatened at all. So, but yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. And, um, yeah, and the gorillas were, were incredible. Like I, I bent down to, uh, to tie my shoe at one point and looked up and there's just this gorilla, like 10 feet away from me, just sitting there staring at me, watching me tie my shoe. <laughs> and so I told the group, I'm like, Hey, there's, there's one right here. And next thing you know, we're surrounded by family of them big silverbacks there there's little little babies was that there. was it a little scary were you or did they say you don't have anything to worry about or i mean there's there's a lot of videos of these gorillas like grabbing people and dragging them away so oh shit that was that was in my head but <laughs> you, you don't really yeah you don't it's great like you look into their eyes man it's there's they're intelligent like i feel like 
if you were being a dick to the gorillas, then they might mess with you. But if you're just relaxed, and I feel like that's that's how I I kind of apply that to all of my wildlife photography. Just stay chill. The animal is usually pretty chill. Mm. Um, so yeah, from after the gorillas, we flew to Kenya and drove north a few hours and basically just did a bunch of different safaris at uh, a bunch of different parks, Samburu, um, Old Pajeda, Masai Mara. Masai Mara was like the highlight. I remember growing up watching nature documentaries and like seeing the wildebeest jump across the Mara River while the, the crocodiles grab them. We stayed at that spot. Wow. I got to lay down on the banks of the river and photograph hippos in the place where I've seen as a child. Like it was, it was pretty cool. And like yeah. we had to be escorted down there by legit Maasai guards. That's so cool, was, man. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was a really, really cool experience to see that part of the world and to like it, it was so real. Like everything you see in a documentary is real. Like on our way to our first camp in Maasai Mara, there's lions just ripping apart this topi, which is a little antelope type thing. Yeah. Like it was. It was so real. You see cheetahs chasing stuff. You see cheetahs, you know, sleeping underneath vehicles. You see elephants chasing things. Like everything was there. Everything you'd expect to see was there. It was. It was so cool. It, it was, I, I did a safari too, and I totally agree. It was everything you watch in the BBC, you know, wildlife documentary, stuff like that. It was, it's so surreal to actually be there. And you're, you're like seeing these animals are like fake in your mind because they're so unbelievably beautiful and like exotic. And you can't, you never see anything like that in Canada, right? And, yep. Um, unless you went to a zoo, which is sad, but you know. <laughs> Um, but yes. when you went, but when you see them moving and hunting and eating, like, it's just like, I remember just being, my mind was blown away. Like it was almost hard to like take video. Like I was trying to film and I was just like almost too blown away to like, yeah, that's the thing too, right? A lot of times you have to just, just try to take it all in and not, not shoot for, for two seconds. And uh, part of me, like my camera shoots at 14 frames per second and it's not quiet. And like, it's. It's an, I'm, I know I'm annoying people around me, <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> so I, and I only had so much so much memory while I was there, so I had to be uh, conservative about that. So yeah, there was there was times where I kind of forced myself to just be like, "Holy shit, there's a lion!" <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so cool that you got to do that. That's a that's definitely a trip. Like if you if you want to see what wildlife like. Like it's, if it almost yeah. feels like original wildlife, I don't know how to like, maybe cause it's just so, it's so like pushed on you and not pushed, but like, I remember watching like national geographic, um, on film, they used to bring out the projector in grade school, but they still had projectors. Do you ever remember they bust, bust those out? I went to sandwich. Oh, yeah. Did you go to sandwich grade school or no? No, I, I went to St. Paul's also. Okay. Since you mentioned sandwich, to us, that sounds like a normal name. Out here, when I say I went to Sandwich Secondary School, like, what, what the fuck? fuck? <laughs> yeah, dude, like it's the, the stupidest name. <laughs> yeah, like the food. Yeah, like I don't know <laughs> where they got that name from for that com- for this that uh, the community the sandwich, ta- the township or whatever it is. Yeah, like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, but I it, went to St. Paul's. I went to the one where they built the gas station right next to, and that's. Uh, that was just the big controversy okay. there because they were worried about all the fumes from the cars poisoning <laughs> all the children. <laughs> Probably a bad idea. But anyway, I yeah. remember I remember watching like from early on. I always loved the wildlife like documentaries and just like the idea that these things exist and stuff like that. So when you got to see them in real life, I'm kind of being redundant, but it was just it definitely is. Um, it's like kind of like it's it's definitely like change. It changed me. You know, yep. like it, it put a reality, it, it brought real, like it's not so mystical, mystical, like there's real problems with conservation and stuff like that. And like, this is a, like, until you're actually there on safari, like, you, you know, like, oh wow. Okay. I get it. Yeah. I get it now. So, which is interesting how, like, even watching the BBC, like even watching those amazing documentaries and there's filmed so well until you actually go there, like there's something about 
being with an being close to an animal like that that changes it and video and photography almost can't do that right yeah totally yeah like a, a photo is one thing but actually being there and it yeah there's there's not it, it's special you get to see some pretty pretty amazing stuff so so then after after africa which was like the most incredible thing ever a couple weeks after i get to terrace I come across a wild mountain lion and her two kittens. Like, I've... Like, Just when I, you got I, back? I, pretty much, yeah. Like a week or two after I got back. I'm driving and they cross the highway in front of me and they let me get photos of them. It was... Like, that's the rarest thing I've ever, ever seen, ever photographed. It, like, that's, that was the highlight. So it went from, like, Africa being so amazing and then all of a sudden, how could that be top? wow, there's mountain lions. Like, I always know they're here. Like, there was a, a donkey in my neighborhood got killed two years ago by one. They, oh, man. They regularly are in, in the area, but you never see them. Like, they're very stealthy. You just, you know they're there. You see their tracks and now, the trouble they cause, but, yeah. Do you, do you do a lot of reading on animals and, I would imagine, studying the species uh, that, you photograph, that you photograph or no? What do you... I mean, sometimes, yeah, there's been... Yeah, I've, I've definitely like read scientific papers on lynx and uh, and cougars. Just mainly those, mainly lynx. Lynx have become a, a real target of mine lately. I don't know what what happened, but I went from like rarely seeing lynx to I think I've photographed fourteen or fifteen individuals in the last couple of years. It's been crazy. Do you I, think? Um, do you think their their population is growing or? It definitely has in this area, but since I got back from Africa, I haven't been able to find one at all. So there, it's I was able to keep kind of there's there's areas where they are, and I've been able to keep tabs on them, kind of like if if you're in the area enough, eventually you might see one, mm. and that happened enough times in similar areas that you kind of just get a feel for the population in that area. But I yeah, being away for a few weeks, they're gone, and now that there's leaves on stuff, like it's. I'll probably have to wait till winter to find them again. But I mean, that's one of the ones where I'm trying to figure out, like I'm trying to learn what's their, how big is their territory? And you start reading and it's, you know, depending on food source, which is typically um, snowshoe hare, that's like 90% of their diet. So when the snowshoe hare population takes a dive, so does the lynx population. But there's been collared lynx that have literally traveled over a thousand kilometers to find food. Mm. So, they're 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 like moving needles in a haystack. It it really is just you, yeah. You just gotta put the time in and and go find them. And then a lot of the knowledge I get about animals and behavior is by just like actually watching it happen right in front of me. Yeah, putting the time in and actually spending the time just to sit there and wait. Yep. Yeah. That would definitely be the hardest part. I mean, how did you, is that something that comes naturally to you? Is, 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 like you talked about being a young kid and just sitting and it's easy to watch the animal be an animal. Yeah, I've, I've always had, uh, I don't know, I guess good patience with stuff. And I, yeah, maybe it's from all the concussions. Maybe <laughs> I've always just had a bit of a simple mind. But yeah, I can, I could totally just hang out with any animal and, and like it, it could do something and genuinely make me laugh. It's an animal. It shouldn't be making me laugh, but yeah, I, so I can hang out. Um, I really don't sit and wait too, too much, though, unless I know there's a good chance of seeing something in that spot. Like if there's like a dead sea lion or something, that's something I would sit and wait on and wait for wolves or mm. bears to show up. But like 90% of what I do is drive. Okay. I just drive. So I'll do like a, uh, anywhere from 400 to 1,000 kilometers in a weekend usually wow. looking for stuff. So, and, uh, but how do you know where the animals are going to be and stuff like that? Do you talk to other people or? I, occasionally I'll get, someone will give me a tip on something, but I, I've just been in this area so long and I've driven these highways so much that I kind of just know where things should be based on certain habitats and where I've seen stuff before, um, certain times of the year, things are in different areas. Like once salmon start to, you know, fill the rivers, that's, that's where all the wildlife goes to, to feed on the salmon. So 
Uh, like right now, grizzly bears are still way up in the mountains feeding on whatever they can find, mountain goats and stuff that have been killed by avalanches. And then they'll eventually move down, start feeding on roots and sedges and then berries and then salmon. So once you know food sources mm. and a bit of behavior, you can kind of narrow it down a bit. But it really is just trying to cover lots of ground. It's crazy, man. That's a lot to learn. Like it's a lot to learn about what the animals eat where they eat it, what time, you know, what's in what seasons do they eat? What do they eat? You know, I'm trying to think, uh, for young people trying to start out. Um, I mean, you, you would just generally, you'd probably just have to be passionate like you are. And it would just have to come naturally that you want to be interested in learning all of these things to get these photographs, right? Because some of these photographs you got, like not to keep pressing it, but it just, um, they're unbelievable, man. Like I'm surprised, <clears throat> um that you're not able to make it happen like full time but there's must be a lot that i don't understand about that um like re i'm sure like couldn't you reach out to national uh canadian national geographic and do they have like assigned photographers and stuff like that yeah it's it's just really it's tricky the, the main reason is all the animals that photograph don't pay me to photograph them like people <laughs> would and I really, like, I, I've shot lots of weddings. Um, that's what I used to do in Windsor when I was at, back there for two years. I did a lot of weddings. Okay. Um, do, you, do you know Erica and Josh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Clausen? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I used to shoot with them. Okay. Um, and, yeah, it's it. Ha I, I did a few out here, and I just, I wanted to focus on being the best wildlife photographer and... Shooting weddings is great for learning how to use your camera and, and, and people yeah. and stuff. And, and you get to make money doing it, whereas I just spend money to do the photography that I do. But, you know, every once in a while, someone will buy a print, and that's pretty cool. Uh, yeah. That's that's what I like to do. Books are, are a cool way to, to get lots of photos out. Um, but I also, there's a cool part of having a job, too, because I don't have to rely on like, man, I just spent so much money on fuel. I just wasted so much time. Yes, I listened to podcasts and learned some stuff, but, like, I didn't make any money. And it's, uh, yeah, it's, I don't know. It would be, so without that pressure, having the, a steady job takes some of that away. If that, I like, see. I just kinda, no, I know what you mean. Having so it, yeah. So I don't know. I, I know a part of me is definitely scared to try and make that jump. But I also <laughs> know to pick my battles, and um, yeah, I'm 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 getting better. Like I just made an online store for my my stuff, and that was that was a process. Man, even just writing a, a caption for an Instagram post, I overthink that so much. Like, okay, it'll oh man, it's 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 hard, and it should not be at all. Whoa. So that's why it's just like. Black Bear, Northwest BC. Because I've spent 10 minutes trying to write a sentence or something about it. Like, I, I give up. It's a bear. That's it. I don't need, like, and, and I, I see that too on Instagram. It seems like people need the six paragraphs of, you know, what the, what the dew on the grass looked like when you saw the animal that day just to sell the photo. And I, I would rather just either like the picture or you don't. You shouldn't have to read and uh, yeah no i feel you yeah it should speak for itself uh, yeah I, I know a lot of people like to read the story behind stuff um but you got i like what you're saying you got to stay true to who you are and what comes naturally to you and um that's important too because if you don't you kind of you end up diverting into different things and you're spreading your time into different areas i think down the road like I'm like, I can't, I can't imagine why you wouldn't be able to just do photography for a living. I think it's just a matter of time because your stuff's unbelievable, man. It's like, I don't know anybody else that, um, takes photos like that personally. So, I mean, when I look at, when I, when I watch Nat, like, uh, Nat Geo stuff or look at their photos, I'm just like, Brandon's are just as good, if not better, um, in certain situations. So, um, yeah, it's just a matter of time and just keep doing what you love, right? Yeah, thanks, man. Um, I want to talk about like close encounters. Like, have you ever had any dangerous situations with like, I know you shoot, you've shot a lot of different bears, grizzly bears and stuff like that. Like, has there been ever 
anything crazy went down with an animal? No, nothing like, I mean, there's, there's times where bears will let me know when the, the photo shoots over by, <laughs> and it, it's never, it's rarely when it's just me and the bear. Cause what I do, I, I'm driving around, I'll see an animal, I'll stop and I'll watch it for a while and see what direction it is traveling. So then I will go position myself in the direction it's traveling. So the bear or whatever animal walks towards me and then can see me. I'm not surprising it. It knows I'm there and it can, it can choose to come as close to me as it wants. And it's, it's when another vehicle stops, I could be totally fine with this bear. We could be hanging out for 20 minutes and it's eating another vehicle stop. And all of a sudden that bear will turn at me, start pop its jaws. And, and that's when I need to get out of there. Where do you learn and that type of, like how to deal with the behaviors do you, are you reading on stuff like that because that that can't just come to people <laughs> it kind of just does yeah you by watching bears enough and seeing them act like you'll see their like the other day i was photographing this huge male probably one of the biggest black bears i've ever seen and it was funny when i pulled up i could only see him he was standing in this like marshy area he was just standing there but i could hear sounds that were coming from like where he was, but it just didn't make sense. And then all of a sudden this huge female bear comes up out of this like indent where there was a, a little pond, like a little watery area. And again, I'm, we're, we're hanging out, they're feeding. I'm now down at eye level with them, which is something I like to do with wildlife, try to get on the you know eye level with them. Mm. And, but in that case, it put me with like this huge rock wall behind me. So I kind of have nowhere to go, but there's also lots of space for them to go. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just hanging out and uh, the female starts making her way over to the male and her ears went back and she just attacked him. They started brawling right in front of me. Like we're talking 30 meters away. These two huge animals are, are fighting. And I mean, I spent a lot of time outside alone. So my, my mind wanders. So part of me is like, what if these two black bears know how to hunt together? Because, like, you, you see these things in uh, these National Geographic BBC shows. Like, there's one now. They've got these five cheetahs that hunt together in Maasai Mara. And I, I saw those cheetahs. So certain groups of animals can learn to do really specified things. So I'm pretty sure it's a male and female that are doing courting things. But at the same time, it's like, I hope these two bears don't turn and come at me. So I, they just, I just started shooting. There's nothing I could do. I'm, I've got a rock wall here. It's just hope for the best and hope they, they don't. I mean, the only real danger would have been if they weren't even paying attention and literally just bumped into me. Like that's hundreds of pounds of weight that would have crushed me. But yeah, they, they always seem pretty, pretty relaxed. Like as long, I feel like it's as weird as it sounds. I think it's the energy you, you put out. Like mm. it's not to sound all woo woo and spiritual, but I feel like if I'm all nervous and, and freaked out around a bear, then the bear's going to be like, what the hell is this guy all weird about? Yeah. And, um, if you're, if you're calm, then, then the animals calm and it, you got it. That's another reason I just kind of watch the animal for a bit first is because I don't know what kind of day that animal has been having like especially tourist season. People, people stop and feed bears here. People will harass them. Truckers honk at them. Like, I do not know what kind of day that animal's been having. And maybe the last thing it needs is some, some dude clicking away from, you know, 30 meters away. So yeah, I, I try to, I try to be safe. I try to read the situation as best as possible, but yeah, ultimately there is knowing that I could get attacked and killed by an animal anytime I'm out is always there in the mind. Have you just, have you kind of accepted it in a weird way? Like, I, I, like, this is kind of, part I mean, of... I've, I've like, I, no, I don't want to be like, I don't want to get attacked by a bear and be like, yeah, obviously Brandon got attacked by a bear. Like, have you seen? Like, I don't want that. I don't want to be that guy. I do it. I do it safely. Um, but yeah, like I've visualized being attacked by bears all the time. Like I've, it, yeah, it, I don't know. It's like being on an airplane. Yeah. Sometimes they crash. You just kind of have to accept that when you go on. And I feel like when you do accept that and know all the dangers, it somehow becomes a little less stressful. No, like, I, I agree. I agree. I think it's important to do that, especially if you're, if you know you're going into could, what could be a dangerous situation. Um, it's good to visualize it because at least then it, nothing's a surprise. 
If you're not, if you're kind of going oblivious, then you're like, oh shit, oh, yeah, what's yeah. happening? He- headphones on, just <laughs> off into the bush, like completely oblivious to your surroundings. Honestly, I'm surprised more people don't get attacked by bears. Like if they saw how stupid some some of us are in the bush and how oblivious, like we're. I, yeah. Any time a bear runs away from me, I'm like, dude, I'm like, I'm like 150 pounds. Like you could just knock me over and we're <laughs> we're done. Like it's. Yeah, it yeah. wouldn't be hard to eat eat me for a snack for sure. And I do want to say too, I always have bear spray with me. I was gonna I'm ask you. Just, yeah. I'm not just hoping for the best. I am. But again, I don't want to have to use it. I don't want to ever make a bear try to attack. Like so, it's. Yeah. yeah anytime I sense it, I'm I'm affecting the bear or any animal's behavior. I'm out of there. Yeah. It's not worth it. If there's a, if it's in a weird spot, like in a dangerous spot to stop on the highway, it's not worth it. I don't stop there. Like it, it's just not worth it for the, uh, for the photo. It's, it's the a, calculated risks is what I feel like I take. Yeah. No, being aware, taking your time, um, uh, feeling, you know, how, um, how are you acting? You know, are you having... The, I think the animals can sense that. I mean, you can sense that when you're hanging around other people. Like, if someone's having a bad day, you don't need to use language to understand if someone... Like, that person looks pissed off. I think yeah, I'm going to totally. stay away from them today. <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm sure the animals uh, know what's happening with their <laughs> emotions. Um, I wanted to talk to you about editing photos and stuff like that. How much do you like... Like, are you a big believer in getting the photo in the moment and keeping it as real as possible um, and not doing a lot yeah. of editing or revert or the other, the opposite. You know, I, I, I mean, I hate sitting at my computer. Like I don't <laughs> like editing. All I do is edit my picture to look like it did when I took the picture. So, I mean, newer cameras, like my, my camera now, the white balance is pretty, pretty bang on right out of camera every time. And the, um, yeah, so, so that's what I'm doing. I'm adjusting the white balance a little bit, which I'm, uh, I have a color deficiency, so I don't see colors all that right. So I have to use really? like LA, I use like LAB, I, I basically have to zero out a couple numbers on the whitest point on the image to know my image is white. I see, go back and see, I still obviously screw up some of them, but yeah, so I'm just, I'm really just trying to make it look like it did when I was there. I don't, I don't take anything away. Like, if there's like a, a stick or something in front of an animal's face, usually, even if it's a really good photo, I won't even post it because I, I could, I, I don't know. But now it's just, now I'm more, it's worth sharing it even if there is a flaw in it because sometimes the moment is, you know, it's greater than the, the little thing that I see. And I, I'm definitely my biggest critic on stuff. Mm. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't remove anything. I don't add anything to the photos. It's just trying to make them look like, I did, you know, if, if I'm, if I've spent more than like four to six minutes on a photo, then something went wrong. Yeah. yeah. It's, <laughs> when I was looking at the photos, I got that sense. I'm like, it doesn't look like he's manipulating these. Like the, they look, which is really cool. I think it's a testament to you like that. What you see is what you, what you got. And I, I think that's really important with wildlife photography, particularly because I mean, I guess unless you're, you announce that you're like, this is an artistic representation (laughs) of what I saw, but, uh, I think it's good for people to see the real stuff in the environment. It's almost like a document, right? Like a documentary in a photo. For sure. And that's the thing that in wildlife photography is kind of a huge issue is that people present things as real that are not real at all. Like right now. I can come fly to Windsor, pick you up. We can fly to Montana, and we can go rent a snow leopard, a Bengal tiger. Whatever oh, you want, man. We, we can get all the photos you want. We can go in the winter, get them in the snow. We can get them up in the tree, everything. And wolves, any species you want, they've got them at these game farms. You go rent them, and you get photos. You put them on Instagram, and anytime you see a, a lot of the wildlife, there's, there's a, a lot of grizzly bear and wolf shots you see come out of Finland. Those are all baited. Oh my gosh, I, I didn't know they did that. They have like farms with yeah, these animals? Yeah, I mean, there's uh, even the National Geographic, uh, one of their newest things on Netflix or when was it? Yeah, Netflix, Disney Plus, one of those things. I was watching it and I could tell from the situations where they filmed it. Like, oh no. And it, even, it even mentions it. Like some, some footage is other animals are used to represent other animals basically is what it's saying and those oh are, man those are, that's disappointing they're, they're pets man they're just they're just fancy pets 
that's no that, good. That you can go rent. So, yeah, I, I do like to share. That's why I always include that it's a wild animal. Like, um, yeah, and uh, owls too. A lot of guys will put mice in a little container, and an owl will fly. That's where you get an owl shot flying right at the camera. Ow, owls are not just flying at people like that. <laughs> um, I've, I've definitely. Back in the day in Windsor, I was with some people, a part of some baiting, and at one point I also drove up to Quebec to uh, to do that. But mm-hmm. yeah, I've that's not the way to do it. And again, if people are, want to do that, if people want to shoot pets, if people want to bait animals, call them in. Just be honest about it. Yeah. Don't play it off like. You just hiked 14 miles to find this tiger in a snow cave. Like, I, it's just, this was at this location. It's just, yeah. Yeah, no, be trans, so. be just be transparent about it for sure. No, but I, I was, I just, uh, I got the vibe that you didn't do a lot of editing. So I think that's really cool that I could actually see that in the photos. But I wanted to, I wanted to ask you. Um, shit, man, that's, I mean, that's pretty much everything I wanted to talk about. I like how I said I didn't have an agenda, but I do. There's always an agenda, <laughs> no, man, that's but I just, cool, but I, it, yeah. I did want to, I just, it's a good conversation, um, about something I don't know a lot about. And I've been wanting to talk to you for a long time because of the photos you've been putting out and the high caliber that they are. It's super impressive. Um, and, uh, you know, I just, uh, I hope the best for you. I hope that you can keep rising yeah. and rising and uh, don't be so hard on yourself. You're doing really good. <laughs> I'm just trying to trying to get better, man. Good good work with all your stuff too. Thanks, but man. Why did you give away all your stuff? I didn't why give did it all that? away. I have I have tons of gear. I uh, I gave away old equipment. It was just sitting in a box in my like basement, and uh, I was like, I started a YouTube channel. I was like, I need to get a little few more subscribers. I still don't have a lot. But I got a lot more, and I got some people that are sticking around and watching videos consistently now. So it was just about an initiative to, like, I know a lot of young filmmakers don't have equipment. And I was like, I don't use this equipment. So I was like, I'll give it away. You subscribe. And, uh, yeah. Well, so, that, was, that was nice. Even I'm like, man, what is he doing? Like, he's got a YouTube channel. He's giving away all his stuff. How is he going to keep filming? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got, I got some messages from some of my filmmaking friends like, you're fucking crazy. And I'm like, I'm not, <laughs> dude, I'm not giving away like my, my good, my best gear. This is my old gear. It's like, you know, like six yeah. years old. Um, but uh, yeah, man, it's, uh, yeah, thanks. <laughs> yeah, so that's another, like, I've got a YouTube channel with like, I don't know, I got over a thousand subscribers on it, but wow. I don't do anything with Because I, I used to, in Windsor, I used to film these fishing videos. Yes, for this guy. oh yeah, no, I follow you, I follow you, I think. So, I would film these videos, and for some reason, they're on my thing, and now he has a channel, so I need to migrate it all over, but some of those videos have over a hundred thousand views, so, it's, but, they demonetize my stuff, because my subscribers, they made it so you had to have above a thousand subscribers to monetize yeah. stuff. And you have to have so that, over 4,000 4, hours or something, too. Yeah, some kind of minutes. Yeah. So I wasn't able to monetize, so that's why I'm kind of at the point now where I want to move his stuff over to his channel and start doing my own thing. But Yeah, you should, man. It's, it's hard to film what I do because my priority is to get a photo. And literally, sometimes these things are like 30 seconds and it's all over. Yeah. And I also can't give the location away because... I don't need 30 people shoulder to shoulder now photographing this animal in that area. Like that's yeah. how it is in cities where there's population for this big population. And that's why I like here because I don't have to worry about that. So if I'm, if I'm out there with a GoPro, people are like, I know that spot. Yeah. And, you know, hunt, hunters follow me. I don't need to be helping people kill the stuff I'm trying to photograph. Sure. So it, it's, I'm, I really want to film myself out there, but it's it's super tricky. What you? I mean, not to throw suggestions at you, but like you could just do no, like do. a face to face camera, like sorry, face to camera type YouTube vlog style, like after the fact, like just tell this. You could tell the story of a cer- certain photo or an event um, that happened. That's that's, a good idea. that's super interesting too, and they they don't even have to be super long. Like no one said you had to make like ten minute videos. Just make like a you know, two and a half minute videos about photos or one minute videos about a particular photo and tell a story. 
That might be cool, man. Cause you're, dude, you look yeah, good. Yeah. You look good on camera. You sound good. Um, <laughs> no, seriously. And uh, you got great content. So it's like, I think you should be doing that for sure. And if you already have a thousand subscribers, like, um, just get those four thousand hours. You'll be back up to monetization. Yeah. No time for sure. Yeah. Thanks, man. That's a good idea. Sure. Yeah. No worries. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I really. See, I'm terrible at that part, man. No, just, man, you're good. I go up. I take the pictures. I put it on Instagram. It automatically goes to Facebook and Twitter. That's it. Dude, I, <laughs> dude, listen. We, I think we all, like, all of us creatives, like, um, I think me and you are li similar in the sense, like. I, it's not easy to talk in front of the camera, but the more you do it, just like the more you go out and photo uh, photograph animals, the the easier it gets, the more you learn, etc. So like, um, you can do it, man. Um, if I can do it, I'm not that stuff. <laughs> you can do it. <laughs> I got a new camera that shoots sweet videos, so, so do, I should yeah. start to use it. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you. I appreciate you doing this with me, man. It's been it's been great to catch up, and uh, again great stuff like loving the pictures i'll keep following and keep uh, sending you my claps on instagram <laughs> and uh yeah maybe, Thanks, we'll, maybe we'll do this again and you know in a, in a little while and check in on each other again sounds good man yeah thank you very much for all the kind words and for doing this yeah man great. thanks a lot stay safe okay yeah thanks man okay ciao see ya all right that was it with brandon broderick wildlife photographer, amazing photos. I'll leave a link in the description below to all of his work. You should definitely check him out, follow him on his YouTube channel. Uh, sounds like he's doing a lot better than me, which is awesome. But uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this. Hit subscribe if you haven't, it really helps me out big time. Like, comment on this video, and uh, we'll see you guys next week.